You're watching Power Nation. Welcome to Power Nation Builds. Today the focus is taking a sassy and sleek piece of muscle and tuning it into a major ground pounder. Here's engine power. Welcome to engine power and a day Pat and I have been impatiently waiting on. We finally get to start the transformation of this mid 90s themed Pro Street 62 Nova into a modern day street terror we're naming Project Pro Street or No Street. Now here's a quick look at what this car is all about in its current state. The body is all steel except the fiberglass cow hood. The rear quarters are the only thing replaced as far as sheet metal goes. This car is rock solid and ready for what we have planned for it. The interior is subtle and well executed. It sports a nice six point roll cage, bucket racing seats with five point harnesses, along with a nice gauge layout to monitor all the vitals. The switch panel is hidden in the glove box and all the engine electronics are positioned neatly under the dash on the passenger side. Under the trunk lid is a stainless fuel cell, nitrous bottle, and the battery. The rear down bars for the cage tie into the rear subframe rails like they should. Splatter paint was used for a nice finishing touch. Powering this manly machine is a 383 cubic inch small block Chevy. It has a forged bottom end, roller valve train, and dark 215 cc aluminum cylinder heads. A lot of hardware is changing on this car and for good reason. We want a car that handles better, has way more power, and to make a statement on the eyes, has a more aggressive stance. Now, we have all of that covered and you'll see it as this build progresses, but before we tear it down, she deserves a final voyage, so let's roll. Very, very responsive, I mean, it's a, yeah. this thing's, uh, it's, it's pretty sporty. What do you think it'd run in the uh, quarter mile? You know, I, I think with the amount of power, this engine it has between 450 and 500 horsepower, looking at the parts, um, probably an 11 second car. You know, we're gonna double the horsepower of this. Yeah, absolutely. You remember? I'm ready to start on it. The final voyage is over and the transformation to a new era pro streeter has to start somewhere. Now we got to jump by removing the exhaust, drive shaft, radiator, and fuel system from the car, not to mention a few other odds and ends. Now, the big ticket items have to go. The front fenders are steel and have been replaced. Next to come off is the fiberglass hood, which has a four inch cow. Back in the day, we did this all the time. Oh, ow. The headers can be loosened from the cylinder heads and pulled back. And that gives us the green light to remove the engine. Hang tight for a minute. It's always something. And transmission together. Look at that. Clear. Get off there. All right. All right. Whoa. That's not what I wanted to happen, but as long as no one got hurt, we're OK. Finally, we're ready to start some assembly. The front end is going on. It bolts directly to the factory subframe rails with supplied hardware. These are grade eight fasteners that secure it. To complete the assembly, the down bars are installed. Their length is adjustable with heim joints on both ends to help align the fender and door gaps later. Linking the upper and lower ball joints together is the spindle. This is a two inch drop design that will allow us to have an awesome stance. An important step when installing a new steering rack is making sure it's centered so you have an even amount of turns to the left and to the right. Now it's a simple process that only takes a couple minutes to do. First, turn the pinion all the way to the left lock position. Now measure from the end of the tie rod to a solid point on the rack body. We have 15 inches. Now turn the pinion all the way to full right lock and take the same measurement from the same points. We have 9,750. The equation is simple. At full left lock, we had a measurement of 15 inches. At full right lock, it was 9,750. Subtract those two and we get 5,250. 
Now we divide that by 2, which is 2,625, and add that to the short side, which was 9,750. That gives us 12,375. Now the rack is even on both sides. The tie rod ends thread on next. And here's how to get a ballpark alignment. Using the tubular frame rail and the inside of the rotor as a reference, find the equal distance from the front and rear of the rotor from the frame rail. It's 10 and 5 8 inches. Now rotate the tie rod end until it's even with the spindle. Install it and hand tighten your nut. Finally, double check your measurement. On the money. Up next, Arnova gets more upgrades for a new Pro Street reveal. The engine for Project Pro Street or No Street is our 588 cubic inch big block Chevy we built at the end of last season. Woo! Man, that's sweet. 953 on power, 764 on torque. Everything was doing its job. Nice. Good job. Excellent. We've already installed a Wilson manifold, spacer, and throttle body. Robin Lawrence, Holly's EFI guru, has brought their Holly HP EFI system to lend a hand. Well, we need a vacuum port. Otherwise, we can't be speed density. So with longer studs installed, we added a one inch spacer to the mix that was already tapped for measuring manifold vacuum. The red and white wire is your ignition on. Okay. We should be good to fire. Okay. With our high dollar race fuel in the cell and our fuel pressure set, we light her up. Look at that. With a little mechanical and electronical tweaking, the 588 is running nicely. All right, on to glory right here. That's more like it. 925 horse, 748 pound feet of torque. I'm happy with that. All right, start to sneak her down, Oler. Ready? Yep. Slide it on down there. Looking good, looking good. Oh, yeah, there we go. There we go. Let's do a little angle to the dangle there. Persuader. Gravy. When going with a different type of transmission, sometimes the factory tunnel just isn't big enough, which is what happened in our case. So we used a slicer wheel to cut out part of the factory tunnel in the area we needed to make more room. Cutting it out in one piece will allow us to use it as a template so we can make a new one. Using 18 gauge sheet steel, we took some measurements from the old one and transferred them to the sheet. Then we used a plate roller and formed it to the shape you see. We welded it in place and used seam seal on the top and underside to finish it up. For a couple of guys who don't do body work, it turned out really nice. Now the tranny is getting a slow ride on the trans jack. And I have to say, that is one good looking converter. It lined up and registered right on the dowels, and ARP fasteners will keep it in place. This trans is longer than the TH350 that came out, so a new cross member has to be built. I'm removing a little more angle iron that was previously used as the anchor point for the old cross member. Now a new plate we cut is being welded to the frame rail. The three holes are for plug welds to strengthen the bond between it and the rail. It is then welded around the perimeter. Tabs are now welded to the plate. These will allow a bolt to intersect the cross member. Two short pieces of tube were welded to the main cross bar. Bushings with 7 16 inch holes were also installed, allowing these bolts to hold it in place. A couple more bolts in the bottom of the training mount and the engine and trans are in place. 588 inches of big block Chevyness needs big headers to breathe. And we also need a set that will work with our aftermarket front clip as well. And that all happened with one easy call to Lemons Headers in Paso Robles, California. And all we had to do was tell them the engine size, the cylinder head type, and the brand of chassis to get what we needed. 
These are big and beautiful. Two and a quarter inch pipes are welded to three eighths flanges. And these headers are designed for the best possible ground clearance, oil pan room, and spark plug access. A four inch collector attaches to the primaries and has a V-band flange to run with the rest of the exhaust if you choose. They even come equipped with bungs and plugs for O2 sensors. They are offered bare or in a beautiful finish like this. Starting with the passenger side, we will install the tubes per Lemon's instructions. First, the number four tube will go in from the bottom. Second in the lineup is tube number two, also from the bottom. Next up is number six, which goes in from the top. Last on this side is tube eight. We can snug all the header bolts, but we will not tighten them yet. Underneath the car, the gorgeous collector is fitted to the primary tubes. We're, we're close. There we go. Now everything can be tightened. Just an FYI, the passenger side can be installed with the spark plugs and starter in place. Gaskets will go in when they show up. We'll see you in a few minutes. Coming up, Project Pro Street or No Street gets some fab work and some upgrades. The process of building a hot rod can sometimes be one step forward and two steps back, which is the case here. After we installed the beefy Strange Engineering custom drive shaft, we found that we had very little clearance between it and the stock tunnel. So some more surgery and fab has to be done. Some black duct tape was laid out to establish a cut line. Then a cutoff wheel is used to slice the tunnel out. Because the floor has some homemade patch panels welded in, we have to cut through a couple of layers to get the whole section removed. Our new tunnel will be made of this 22 gauge sheet metal we are rolling in the sheet metal roller. Now we can trim the skirts one inch longer than the height of the tunnel. The extra inch will be used for a flange. Fitting it over the cutout section shows the width is spot on. Length is absolutely perfect. Okay, width is good. The flange Pat just bent lays nice and tight against the floor too. Now it needs some heat. Welding it in is simple. Make spot welds every half inch so you don't warp the metal. This method keeps the heat centered in a small area. There is no need to weld the seam entirely. The final step is to seal the entire area with seam sealer to keep out exhaust fumes and smoke from a burnout. The completed job looks good. The most important thing though is we have drive shaft clearance. We made up a couple of dash eight lines to go from the transmission to the cooler. They will route around the tail shaft and then connect to AN fittings we installed in the inlet and outlet of the cooler. Now that we have the rear end completely in, it's time to finish off the rear brake lines. Now what we have here is a Willwood flex line tied into a hard line that we built. It has a three-way union at the center to pass to another flex line going up to the front. It's being secured on the rear axle bracing. I installed a couple of nut certs and Adel clamps will be screwed into those. Finally, the flex lines are connected to the calipers. Another item to add to the list of interference happened here in the engine bay. This fitting that's on the back of the valve cover is used to measure crankcase vacuum. Well, it's resting on the firewall. Now we still want to measure crankcase vacuum, but chances are if we leave this fitting in, when the engine's running, it'll vibrate and snap it off. So a quick relocation is necessary. The valve cover has to be removed for that relocation. Seven fasteners hold it to the cylinder head. Now we can remove the barbed fitting. Replacing it is an eighth inch pipe plug. Make sure you seal the threads with Permatex thread sealant with PTFE. And it goes back on in the reverse order. We told you last time we weren't gonna bore you with any of the wiring, but we're gonna go ahead and show you a few steps that are really important that have to do with the ignition box and the Holly ECU. Now these two heavy leads right here are for the hot and the negative from the ignition box. They have to go directly to the battery. Same goes for the heavy red lead from the Holly ECU. Now we have to extend these because the battery's mounted in the trunk. When we wire a car like this, we like to protect the wires with some kind of wrap. Now this is DEI's Protect a Wire Easy Loom. It comes in several different sizes and it'll avoid the wires from being chafed on any metal objects. 
Here's a little tip when using loom like this. Any splice connections you're gonna make, make sure your wire lengths are staggered. That way you don't have a bunch of connectors in one spot blowing out of the side of the loom. It's pretty simple. I went ahead and ran the wires through the sheet metal on the tub work and followed the main battery cable back here to the battery. Now we have one lead, which is the negative, that'll go to the negative terminal, and two leads will go to the positive. We're not hooking anything to the battery yet because a bunch more wiring has to be done. Wiring is always a time-consuming task that you don't want to mess up. Mistakes here could lead to burnt harnesses or even worse, fried components. Now you want to make sure to have patience and make sure everything is done right the first time. Now I've been wiring this car from the front to the back and everything in between for the last couple of days. So now it's time for that moment of pride or the moment of epic failure. An engine needs fuel to run, so we're going to check the fuel pump next. It was wired in using the VR1 speed controller that came with it. A relay is used in line as well. The switched wire to trigger the relay is hooked to our switch panel. This rocker has a prime and an on position. Right now, we just want to make sure the pump runs. And it does. Fairly quiet too for such a powerful pump. Another successful wiring job. Another component that has to be wired correctly is the water pump. Now you need to make sure that you have the right size relay and all of your connections are super solid. You know what happens if it's not wired correctly and functioning right. It can be a disaster. It needs to be on when the ignition is hot. If controlled by a switch, it could be accidentally left off before noticing an overheating situation. The pride and confidence level is super high right now. We haven't had any epic failures. And we have to take a break, but when we come back, we're gonna test some more things out. So don't go anywhere. Style points all around. Now, how will it perform? We'll stick around and see. We don't have much time left, so we're gonna see how far we can get. We still have to test some stuff in the electrical system to make sure it's functioning properly. We've already had good success with the trans brake, line lock, fuel pump, and water pump, so it's time to move on. The starter is next, and we wired it like an old Ford vehicle using an external solenoid, which we showed you earlier. The trigger wire is connected to the ignition switch at the key. This circuit is one of the highest amp draws in the vehicle, so make sure you have properly sized leads. All right, the moment of truth, see if it turns over. You ready? Uh, yeah. There you go, very I nice. Like that. No smoke, uh, starter actually sounds good. Good deed done. And that's one more thing that's checked off the list. Very cool. Here's a super important safety tip. No matter what car you're building or what you're working on, please make sure that the neutral safety switch functions properly. Now its job is to totally eliminate the possibility of the car starting in any of the forward gears or in reverse. Now this is a function that will be checked at any racetrack you go to by the tech officials. If it doesn't work properly, they're sending you home. Now here's a quick demonstration. If we pull the shifter back in any of the forward gears, the car will not start. Bring it back up into neutral, and we have key. Reverse, nothing. Park, it functions properly and would pass tech. All the components that we tested today have to do with supporting the drivetrain. Now we have to make sure the stuff on the body side works. Pat, hit the brakes, and it does. Let's see if the kill switch works and it does as well like it should. Now the next time you see this Nova, it's gonna be making noise. We're just as excited to see it as you guys are. But remember, patience is a virtue. We went ahead and put the front clip all back together and with a few twists of the strut rods, it lined up really nice. Now it's time to see what 588 cubic inches of big block Chevy power sound like in the car. Now anytime we finished a project or an engine build, we get as excited as a woodpecker in a lumber yard to hear it fire. Let's go, Pat. Here we go. That is oh, how's insane. That, how's that for a success? Oh, man. <laughs> nice. That's the first time we hit the key on the actual engine. Oh, my 
God. Wow. That is unbelievable. That just, that, if that don't get your blood pumping, I, you, you don't like cars. NA power, <laughs> baby. NA, you know, uh, we, hey, nothing wrong with power adders, but uh, we like doing it the natural way. So. That is so awesome. Nice job. Our 62 Nova has come a long way and now it is time for its maiden voyage. And there is no better place to see it run than a drag strip. We're gonna unleash 588 cubic inches of big block Chevy the proper way. The first shakedown pass should prove that all of our efforts have paid off big time. And it does. A 617 at 110. Not too shabby. After a cool down, it's time to lay down the hammer for a bigger run. And as expected, this big block beast lays down a 594 at 118 miles per hour. Hmm, I think I look good in black. Wow, what a solid build. You can see why our team is always up for a high performance challenge. And remember, you can always check out the other great projects that we have right here on Power Nation Builds.